couple of administrative notes and items. Um, there is a handout for most of you. It's a yellowish one. Um, and I didn't grab a large enough stack to put it into the copier, so some of them may have a white back page. But um, there is a handout called Understanding the Intertestamental Period, and it covers <laughs> it covers the, the bulk of what we uh, talked about last week. Um, there is a ton that you can research and study, and on the second to the last page, I put several websites that kind of get you started, um, but there's so much available and so much out there that I didn't, I didn't include all of the resources. Um, <clears throat> but this kind of gives you an overview and then points out some of the, the things, the, the difference that it makes when we understand this intertestamental period, what difference does that make in our, on our understanding of the Bible? Because that's, that really is the focus, is not just learning these historical things for the sake of history, but that we can better understand God's word and how um, when they are interacting, when stuff is going on, you know, why do the Pharisees come after Jesus so much? Why do the Sadducees not like the Pharisees? Why do the Hellenists and the Jews have their arguments in Acts chapter 6? Why, why aren't all of these things happening? Why are there taxes? Why do they not like the Romans? What's, you know, all of that. Um, by understanding the intertestamental period, we have a greater understanding of that. And then the last page in that is a, it's copied out of a book that I, I wrote the, the specific book there in the bottom right corner. Um, but it kind of gives you some major events and dates and timeline as that goes through. So just kind of a, a reference list that you can take a look at. Um, and if you are watching on YouTube and you want a copy of this, make a comment in the, the uh, comment section and I will be able to get that to you somehow. <clears throat> the other question that was asked or comment was made about um, the BC, AD date time frames, why are the numbers going down, why, why do the numbers go up in the AD, um, and why is it that Jesus was not born at zero, but probably about four to six BC. What's, what's going on with that? Um, I did a little bit of research into that, and that is another of those where you could get started and keep going and going and going, and still maybe not find the, the complete answer. Um, the short answer that I could find uh, was that there was a, a monk by the name of Dionysius, in approximately 525 AD that was working on setting up the church calendar, um, mainly focused on Easter's and when Easter would be each year. And he, the, the previous calendar had used the name of a Roman emperor that persecuted Christians, and he didn't like that idea, so he changed the calendar dating system to instead of being based on the eras of the people, it was based on the day of, or the, the years since Christ. But he wasn't like insanely accurate. He wasn't even focused on trying to get that. He was just trying to get, okay, let's, let's get close to. And so he picked 525 as the current year for his dating system, which was close, but off by a few years. Um, Specifically, the Bible does not give us an exact date for when Christ was born or when any of those events happen. So coming up with a, a year for us is not a biblical issue. It's not a biblical mandate. We know that these events happened, but we don't have to know precisely what number of year it happened in. Um, if God wanted to tell us that, he could have, but he didn't. So we don't need to make too big of a deal of it. Um, as you go through in Matthew and Luke, there are a lot of historical individuals that are mentioned, and we can, through archaeology and other historical studies, identify certain dates based on when they lived and when other people lived and comparisons, etc. And that's where, um, historically, it's, it is generally agreed to that Herod, King Herod died in 4 BC, and thus... Christ had to have been born prior to that, so four to six, because um, 
when the um, wise men came was approximately within the first two years. So some of that is approximations. Um, again, it doesn't have to be exact, but like I said, you could spend hours and hours and days and months and years studying this one out. If you want to, go for it. That's the extent that I'm going to on it in this, at this time. Any questions on either of those? All right. We are just about ready to start in on the New Testament. Um, <clears throat> last week, I handed out the, the New Testament sheets for uh, you to kind of take a look at and get general ideas. Um, and we've got a few extra copies of those floating around if you need them back here. Uh, raise your hand if you want one, and they'll pass one to you. So we are getting ready to start in on the New Testament. I don't anticipate this to take nearly as long as the Old Testament, partly because there are way fewer books to look at. Um, but however long it takes, we're going to go through those and then head back for the rest of the doctrinal statement. We have spent a couple, almost three months now, on just point number one in the doctrinal statement. The reason for that is I think that it's very, very important to establish why do we believe the Bible? What is the Bible? And then everything that flows after this is based on number one, that we believe the Bible and that's what we base all of our um, beliefs and, and uh, doctrines on. And so as we get into the other ones, we will probably go through those a lot faster. I'm hoping to spend one, maybe two weeks on each point. So uh, go ahead and get a, a head, sup or head start looking at those. Um, if you want to, like I said, depends on how fast we go through the New Testament. And most of the time, someone laughs at me when I think that I'm going to get through quite a bit. <clears throat> Don't worry, Jan, I'm not pointing you out or anything. <laughs> you can. <laughs> All right. So, uh, without further ado, let's start in on the New Testament. If you would, please make sure that your microphones are on. Um, and Elsha, I think they're, are they, they functioning and working? They may not be feeding back through our sound, but for the recording, um, that is very helpful. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so um, as, we, as we start in on this, there will be dates listed on the left-hand column. Those are one example of dates that are used. There are, if you open up any study Bible, you're going to find a wide array of dates. The reason for that is the New Testament writers did not put a specific date on it. You look at a, a modern book and there's a uh, copyright date on it for when it was published. But the New Testament writers didn't do that. So just like with dating of when was Christ born, there's a lot of indicators, there's a lot of of ways in which people study this and try and identify it, most of the time it's not specific and it doesn't matter that much. We get the approximate time frame and we're pretty close. Um, so I'm not going to focus in on those very much other than maybe a comparison. This one was written before that one, but beyond that, just be aware that there is some discussion about that. Um, the first section of the New Testament, I'm going to call it the history section. It's the Gospels and Acts. Um, five books, and in these it tracks basically what happened with Jesus and what happened with the start of the church. Most of the rest of the books are going to fit inside of that time frame. Um, the letters, the Pauline letters, and the general letters that come after that happen during the time of the, act, the Acts of the Apostles, generally speaking. Um, when we get to some of John's writings towards the end of the New Testament, those were probably after, written after Acts was the account that happened in the book of Acts. Um, some of Paul's last books were probably written after the accounts that take place in Acts. But in general, that's the time frame. And so I'm calling those first five books the history in the New Testament. <clears throat> um, the first three are called the Synoptic Gospels. Now, a question was asked about what, what does synoptic mean, um, and I forgot to look up the specific definition, but 
Seeing together. Okay, I was going to say, it, it has to do with the, the way of looking at something, of a view of something together at the same time. So uh, synoptic is, three of them are very, very similar. That doesn't mean that they're exactly the same. And generally speaking, they come from a little bit of a different perspective and viewpoint. Um, I like the example of if somebody witnesses a car wreck and you're standing on one corner and someone else is standing on another corner, you see the exact same event, but your perspective is a little bit different. The way that you're going to describe it is going to be a little bit different. If one of the drivers you know and the other one, uh, if one person knows one of the drivers and the other person is just a standing, you know, bystander witness, they're going to express it a little bit differently but they're both going to tell the facts of what happened. And so that's, that's kind of what's going on with the Synoptic Gospels, is that they are trying to tell the events of what happened, but they're going to have a little bit of a different perspective, a little bit of a, a different uh, flair to it. And so we're, we will talk a, a little bit about some of those views and what they're emphasizing. Yes? So why are they choosing the Matthew, Mark, and Luke to be similar to John? If, if, you, um, if you look through the, the process that they go through, what's included in them is different. John is going to, to mainly be talking about um, the deity of Christ, a focus on his person, and on uh, seven I am statements. So what he says and what he teaches. Um, and like half the book is the upper room discord, or just the, the events and discussions in the upper room. Whereas the others focus more on his actions and his general ministry, his travels, his, his activities, um, what he does. And so not so much on who he is as what he does is, is kind of the short answer to that. Um, and then if you look at the, the events that are recorded, I think it's 90% of Mark is included in Matthew and Luke. And so there's a, a lot of similarities of the number of events, the flow of events, whereas John is vastly different in how he records and the, the specific events that he digs into. Did you have a question or comment? Okay. <laughs> yes, I got it right. <laughs> the three are very similar in what they cover and what they discuss. Mm -hmm. um, although from different perspectives, like you said, because yep. there are different things. But Matthew is written, seems to be written to the Jew, presenting him as a Jew, the king of the Jews. Yep. And um, each one has a different perspective. Perspective, kind of a, 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 well, a different perspective on Christ. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and. Yep. Yep. Linda? Uh, in, in this book, I, and I've written this down in my other Bible, but I, uh, I'll just read it here. It says Matthew presents Jesus as the Christ, Israel's uh, messianic king, uh, messianic king. Yep. Mark presents Jesus as the servant. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Luke presents Jesus as the perfect son of man, mm -hmm. whose mission was to seek and to save. And John uh, is presents Jesus as the eternal son of God. So, uh, and I, somewhere in one of our Bible studies, we, we've come up with that in, in my other Bible that I have. I have that written across the front so that it reminds me of what to look for. Yeah. Particularly in that, in that gospel. Yeah. Those, those are pretty accurate. And I, I like having that in mind as I go through these because then, yeah, you do have kind of a, a general idea of what perspective are they taking. What are they going to be dealing with? What's being emphasized? Um, and several of these, we're going we're gonna to talk about kind of those key ideas that come out of the book. Um, 
as we analyze those, I would, I would caution about getting too much into it and assuming that only, only Matthew is dealing with the messianic kingdom idea. Well, no, that's, that's throughout a lot of them, but that is an emphasis of it. Or that, well, because Matthew is emphasizing the messianic kingdom, no Gentile would ever need to read it. Well, obviously, if it's God's word, then Gentiles were intended to read it. And so it's, it's written to the Jews with a broader audience type of an idea. So, I, and I don't think that you guys would, would necessarily overemphasize that, but just keep that in mind as well. Yes, sir. Yes. And the similarities complement each other. Yes. The, the result is a comprehensive, fourfold record of the redemptive ministry of Jesus Christ. Nice. So the differences are there, but they supplement each other. They don't contradict. Yeah. And, and that is one where if you, th there are places where it's a little bit challenging. Like, okay, now how did this work? I thought he did this or he said it that way. And you start digging in, and they're not contradictory. It's possible that it's a different time frame. It's possible that you know the same type of event happened multiple times. Um, it's also possible that one of them is recording it in a particular way, and another one is recording it in a different way. One, one gives the overview, and the other gives the details. Well, the fact that the overview doesn't record all the details doesn't mean that the details are inaccurate. Um, and then another thing that will sometimes happen is they'll use a little bit different wording and phrasing. And so just you may have to dig into some of the original languages to understand they're not contradictory to each other, even though English, it doesn't line up and doesn't make sense. So yeah, if you th find something that someone says, oh, well, this is a contradiction, dig a little deeper, you'll find out it's not. But um, yeah, they, they complement each other. Yes? I think another thing too is that uh, they're not all just chronological. Yes. Uh, they say that Luke's, because of his uh, being a doctor of most women of, of the four, uh, he, he wanted, he wrote his to, to this Theophilus mm -hmm. in a chronological manner. Kind of wanted that this happened and then this happened and then this happened. But the other ones, they were just. They worked that chronological, and that's why people can get confused. Yeah. And a lot is because some of the names are used one way in one and used as a, another name in another book. Yep. Make people think that that, and we found that out when we were looking at the uh, apostles. Yeah. When, when we were on Sunday mornings. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah. And we've got to find that out too. It's, yeah, yeah. Don't don't assume that these are uh, in a chronological form. Um, uh, well, with the Revelation study as well as in uh, Mark, there's a Greek term called chi, and basically it means and, but it's not always this and then this and then this and then this. It's this and this and this and this and this and. This and so it, it doesn't have to be organized in the way that we may think of it being organized. Um, and part of that goes back then to what are they emphasizing? What are they trying to focus in on? So let's, let's start off with Matthew. Um, I've got it, it written down that it's generally viewed as emphasizing Jesus as the Messiah and King. The Messiah is the Old Testament prophesied one who is coming. Now, with that intertestamental period understanding, one of the things that I, I've got written in there is there were Jews who were looking for a Messiah, but the Messiah they were looking for was a political and military hero, a political leader and a military hero, not a spiritual savior. And so what they were expecting and what they saw were two completely different things. Well, that caused some troubles. And so Matthew is helping to explain that. Matthew's going to quote a lot of the Old Testament. He, he's going to bring in 
um, Old Testament things that happened, he also writes down a lot of the, the speeches that Jesus gives. Um, some people have said that Matthew is structured around five discourses or sermons or, or things that he has said. And so if Matthew is, is focused on helping Jews understand that the prophecies are fulfilled in Jesus, he's going to write about some things that wouldn't necessarily be interesting, interesting that other writers wouldn't be as interested in, if I can get it out. Um, one good example is the genealogies that he records. He records a different genealogy than Luke does. Not that they contradict, but they complement each other because they're tracking different um, parentage way, way back. Um, do what? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, more detail in that, and more detail just in general of fulfillment of the Old Testament, um, because the Jews wanted that fulfillment. They wanted the prophecies to be, or the promises in the prophecies to be, to happen. And so Matthew is letting it be known, that's who this is. Jesus is the Messiah. <clears throat> um, it was looked at as having the, the primacy primacy or, or first place historically. That's why it's listed first. Um, Matthew and John are the only ones written by apostles. That confuses some people sometimes. Mark and Luke were not apostles, but Mark writes what Peter and Paul had told him. And so it's, it's, and it was inspired by God. So there's no issue with the fact that Mark wasn't an apostle. Um, but he's recording the things that were, were told and that had happened and probably recording some of the sermons that Peter preached and things of that nature. Luke um, is specifically going to say, hey, I went and researched this. I talked to all of the people to get the information to write it all down. Um, which, when you, rewinding a little bit back to this, the idea of the synoptic gospels, there's a, a concept called the synoptic problem. And there's, there's this an attempt to make it sound like it's a bad thing, but it really isn't. The similarities between Matthew and Mark and Luke are sometimes pointed at, as a, at, like I said, as a bad thing. But it makes perfect sense if Luke is trying to gather all of the resources and he has Matthew and has Mark that he can reference. It makes sense that he would include some of those things. There's no issue there. There's no problem there. Um, but anyway, back to Matthew. Um, it was written by Matthew, who was an apostle. Um, it's possible that it was one of the first ones written. Um, there's, again, dates are a little bit challenging. Matthew is thought by some to be written first. Mark is thought by some to be written first. Doesn't really matter. Okay. Uh, any other comments or thoughts, additions on uh, the Gospel of Matthew? All right. Uh, Gospel of Mark was written by John Mark, um, who, as, as we saw on Sunday morning when we started in on that book, um, f was a person that accompanied Paul on his first missionary journey partway, and then he went home. Why? We're not told. But it left a bad taste in Paul's mouth, and so he didn't really want to work with Mark on the next time around. But Barnabas said, I'm going to take Mark, and you take Silvanus, Silas, and we're going to go our separate ways. Um, there's a whole lot there. I'm not going to get into all of that right now, but it's likely that that is the Mark who writes the Gospel of Mark. Um, young man by the name of John Mark, possibly a youth during the time of Christ, um, and then follows Paul and follows Peter around, learns from them, and writes down the accounts that they gave to him. It is the shortest gospel, and it really emphasizes uh, Jesus as the son and servant of God. That's, that's the focus. Um, it's general, so it's not written specifically to the Jews or the Gentiles. Most likely it was written somewhere in the range of Rome for the Romans, 
to be able to understand who Jesus was. Um, and so there's a lot of activity going on. There's a lot of the events that Jesus does, not so much his teaching and his preaching. Um, <clears throat> but it is, it is kind of a general, general uh, gospel, whereas Matthew was written to the Jews with certain emphasis um, to all nations. Which, which, as I was studying and looking into, I just noticed my note to mention this one. Um, with Matthew, there's a universality that's included in it. Even though he's focused on the Jews, who is it that shows up at the birth of, or shortly after the birth of Christ? The Magi, who are from far away. You get all the way to the end of the book, and who is it that, that they are told to make disciples of? All nations. So even though it's focused on the Jews, it is very much a, a letter for all of the nations. Did you have a question or comment? I was going to say, uh, it seems like Mark also focuses on uh, Jesus' power and authority. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the theme throughout the book. No, I didn't, but that makes sense, yeah. Um, his, his actions and the display, his authority, which kind of changes the, the idea and the mindset if he is the servant of God who's in authority and who has power, that is completely different than what they would have thought of as a servant, as someone who's lowly and weak and incapable, and yet Jesus flips that on its head. If Jesus came not to, to be served but to serve and sets a completely different example, that's going to change the mindset. Um, if, if you recall just general history, in Rome, there were more slaves than freed people. There were, there were more servants than regular population. And so Jesus being presented as a servant with power and authority and ability just is, is earth-shattering. Any other comments on Mark? All right. Moving on to Luke. This is the third of the Synoptic Gospels. Do what? Well, trying to. <clears throat> this is the third of the um, Synoptic Gospels. It is uh, written by Luke, um, who is recorded as a doctor, a physician of some kind. Um, he writes most of this based on interviews, um, and he really kind of emphasizes the humanity of Christ. Um, <clears throat> Just a, an interesting factoid, uh, it is the longest, Luke is the longest writer in the New Testament. Most of the time people think that Paul wrote the most of the New Testament, but it's actually Luke uh, who wrote approximately 25% of the total word count between the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Do what? Um just largest word count total. He writes about 25% of the New Testament. Um, and he, he actually tells us why he was writing, what his, his purpose was. So if you want to grab your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Someone would, uh, Luke 1, 1 through 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent things, that you may have certainty concerning the things Okay. So what is the purpose that Luke is writing for? Okay. He, he knows someone, most excellent Theophilus, that he wants to make sure that they are confident in the accuracy of the things that they've been taught. Um, there's some, some debate or discussion about, well, who is Theophilus? Um, it is a Greek name. It means lover of God. And so just Theo is God. Ophelos is based on the Philadelphia, the, the lover or friend of. 
And so is that his name or is that his title? We don't know. Um, but that's who Luke is writing this to with the purpose that they would know the exact truth. And so he's going to be very um, diligent to make sure that he records things, whereas the others were emphasizing certain aspects of who Jesus was. Luke is wanting to give an accurate and complete record so that they would be able to understand. He, says, he does that starting off in the Gospel of Luke, and then he continues that in the uh, book of Acts. And so he writes both of them with the same purpose, same idea, to the same person. Um, <clears throat> and so it's, that's where he's got the most uh, word count is because he writes both of those. We'll, we'll talk about the, uh, the book of Acts in a little bit. One thing that's unique about Luke is he was a Gentile. The others were written by Jews, and um, Luke was a Gentile. And so he sets out to write an account, a full account of the life of Jesus. That's why um, Matthew and Luke are the only two that record his birth and information surrounding that. Matthew to prove that he was a king, Luke to prove that he's a person, and just give his, his history and his background. Um, Luke emphasizes a lot of the geographical layout it seems that as, as you go through the Gospel of Luke, it's the movements of Jesus into different areas and what he does in those uh, locations along the way. Um, it's based on a lot of interviews, and it is to the Greek audience. So the first one was to the Jewish audience. The second one, Mark, was to probably the Romans, but kind of a general audience. And Luke is to a Greek audience. And so Luke's not going to quote that much from the Old Testament. He's not going to emphasize those ideas as much as things that would be more familiar to the Greeks. Any other questions or comments on uh, the Gospel of Luke? Yeah? I read somewhere that they, they really don't know who Theophilus was. Mm -hmm. There's no other really accounts of him because of the name he uses. Um, some yeah, it it's yeah that that is one theory is that this was somebody who didn't want it known that he was interested in these things, and so it's it's written to him as lover of God, be, or friend of God instead of specifying who he is. But the the um, phrase most excellent kind of implies that he's he's someone of rank or or something. But yeah, we don't we don't know for sure. Um, <clears throat> which is interesting to hypothesize on, but anyway. All right. So those those are the synoptic gospels. Um, like I said, there is not a synoptic problem. Um, you start digging into that and you're going to find all kinds of of ideas and theories and stuff that's written about it. Um, trying Unfortunately, a lot of that is based on an evolutionary mindset that God couldn't have inspired these. They have to be written by human authors for human purposes, so let's, let's overanalyze and figure this out and, and come up with an evolution-based development of it, um, which obviously is not true. God did inspire these. God did want what he wanted recorded, and so, there's, like I said, there's not a problem with this. Um, but if you run into that, phrase. That's kind of the, the background of it. All right, the, the fourth gospel and the last one written was the gospel of John. Um, this is John, the son of Zebedee. As you go through, uh, even, even in chapter one of John, you're going to see multiple people by the name of John. And so it would be a good idea to make sure and differentiate, okay, who are we talking about? Because there are, there are several Johns. Um, I can think of at least three just right off the, the top of my head. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, <clears throat> little side trip. When I was in Bible college, one of the first uh, sermons that I had to write was on John chapter 1. And I got a bad grade because I didn't differentiate between which John was being talked about. Because there's John the Apostle and John the Baptist are both in there. And I, I conflated the two together. And so it was a very good learning lesson for me to, hey, go back, read it through, make sure you know which one's what and who's going on and all of that stuff. So that's why I emphasize um, 
there are multiple Johns. Pay attention to which one's happening. Um, <coughs> let's see. It, it is the last of the four to be written, and it really focuses on the deity of Christ. Um, he also expresses why he was written, writing, and that's in John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31. John 20, 30 through 31. If someone would read it when they get there. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Okay. So John makes it very clear why he's writing so that people would believe and have life in his name, um, and that they would know who Jesus is. He is the Christ, so he is fulfillment of the Old Testament, and more, more specifically, he is the Son of God. And so from the very first chapter all the way to the very end, that's an emphasis that you're going to find in um, <clears throat> the Gospel of John. This one is structured around seven I am statements. And if you remember from the Old Testament, that term, I am, is a, a link to God. That when um, Moses asks, hey, who should I say sent me to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I am is the response that he gives. Well, when, when Jesus uses that phrase, I am, there is a, a level of connection to God that he is bringing out as well. Um, but then it also those seven uses of the I am um, also emphasize different aspects about who he is. And I thought that I had those written down, but I don't at the moment. Um, and they're, they're like, I am the door. I am the way. I am the bread of life. Someone with a computer could probably pull that up really quick and let us know what all seven of them are, please. All right. <coughs> I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the door. I am the bread. It's five. Huh? Vine. I am the vine. Okay. Anybody else remember what the last one is? It's not coming to me. Hmm. Good Shepherd. I am the Good Shepherd. I think that's the seventh one. <clears throat> oh, you got it? So that's, that's the emphasis or one of the main focus, focal points of John. Um, it is written much later than the others. When the first three were written, the temple was still in place. The, the Jews were still functioning fairly well. By the time that John is written, uh, the temple had been destroyed. And so the, the dispersion of the Jews had happened. And so the, the environment, the world that John is writing to is different than what the other um, gospel writers were dealing with. So just one of those things to, to kind of be aware of as well. Any other comments on any of the gospels? Yeah. How do we know when it was written? Um, it's a good question. Yeah. It, it is based on when John was writing his other things. Um, based on when people started having copies of it and being aware of it, um, <clears throat> based on how old some of those copies are and when they, when they got them. So like if you got a letter, you'd know about when you got it. Maybe not the exact date, but you'd remember, oh yeah, it was when I was living in Missouri. And so it, it would be this range. In 20 years, if you found that letter, you say, oh yeah, that was back from when I was in Missouri. Well, you don't know exactly what day or what year, but you know approximately. 
Does that make sense? So, so John writes this as a letter. I mean, really, we're going to call some of these letters and some of them not, but reality is these are written mostly as letters to either people or churches or um, the broader spectrum. And so, um, yeah, when, when John writes this out, it would be remembered, oh, okay, that was approximately this time frame. That was a long answer, I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> All right, then the next one is um, Acts. This is a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. And so Luke and Acts are often um, put side by side in, in some documents and stuff because of that. Um, most likely, they were written pretty close together. One, and then a pause, and then the other but not a, a big span between them. And it is possible, some people think that, that this was written in defense of Paul at his trial. <clears throat> um, one of the things to notice in the book of Acts is that as, as it starts, he's recording things that happened. And so-and-so did this, and these people did that, and they uh, said these things, and they went to those places, and they, they, they. And then in chapter 16, there's a shift in which it starts to say, and we went, and we did these things. And so that's a, an indicator of where um, Luke participated in some things and was a, accompanied Paul in these journeys, whereas some of them were just the things that he had recorded about it. Um, the book itself provides a history of the church. It gives an account of how the gospel was spread, starting off in Jerusalem and spread throughout to all of the Gentiles. Um, and Acts chapter 1 verse 8 kind of gives the, the framework that he's going to use for that. So let's turn there. <clears throat> Acts 1 8. So a, a recognition, okay, first of all, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you. That's going to give you the power, the ability to do this crazy mission that God has given for you, to spread the gospel to the whole world. But you're going to start in Jerusalem, and then it's going to expand out from there. And so as you read through the, the book of Acts, you're going to see they start out in Jerusalem. And then there are little excursions into the broader area, and then ultimately we pick up the, the story with Paul, who goes out to the uttermost parts of the world. He goes um, throughout the Roman Empire, ultimately ending up in Rome. And that's where the, the book ends, is he's there waiting for trial. <clears throat> so it, it records the, the early part of the church, and then the spread from there. Any, any questions or comments on Acts or the historical section? Um, just, just in general, yes. In general, um, the, the phrasing of what he's talking about is, that's called uh, third person, that he's pointing to others, to them, they, those people. And then in, starting off in 16, it's we went to. And so that shift um, is, is interesting just to see, okay, it looks like that's where Luke joined up with the, the party and started traveling with them. Um, along the way. All right. The next section then deals with the Pauline letters. The, the first section is five books. This one is 13 books. Um, <clears throat> starting off with Romans. And, well, so the, the Pauline letters are not arranged chronologically. Um, they are, generally speaking, arranged by size. The bigger books are earlier, and the smaller books are later. So Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, those are really big and long books. Uh, you get down towards the end, Titus, Philemon, those are very, very short books. There's, that's the, the rhyme and reason for why they are in the order that they are. So as you read through, that's where it's, it's good 
to have an idea of when they were written, who they were written to, um, and where they were written from. Because some of these were written during Paul's missionary journeys as he was in different places. Others were written while he's sitting in prison awaiting trial. Um, some of them are written fairly early in Paul's activities and some much later as he's traveling around. Um, so just kind of be aware of that. Some, there, there are some commentators that you will read that try to read a lot into that. I don't think that there's, there's much to read into that. Um, some people say that, that Paul's theology developed as he went along, except God's theology doesn't change as he goes along. And God is the ultimate author. He's the one who inspired this. And so it's not that Paul learns from his mistakes and understands different things in what he writes. Um, and so don't, don't read into it things of that nature. But have a general idea of when it was written, where it was written from, and, and why he was writing it as well. So Romans, um, so, oh, and another thing about the Pauline letters, they all start off with some kind of a, I, Paul, write this, or this is from Paul, or Paul, an apostle, or, you know, something of that nature. Um, so that's where verse one, uh, chapter one, verse one of each of these is going to tell you it's from Paul. Oftentimes, though, it's not just Paul. It's Paul and somebody else. Paul and one, his, one of his companions who are writing these things. Um, and so Romans was most likely written from Corinth, um, and it is a major treatise on salvation, and that it's only available through Jesus. It is a very complex book. There's a lot of legal arguments, um, and you, re you remember Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was up and coming in the, the elites of his um, order, and so when he becomes a Christian, he doesn't throw away all of that learning and knowledge and experience that he had. He brings that to bear as he writes these things. He is writing a very well-explained, um, well-argued treatise about justification, about salvation, about the, the effect of belief in Jesus. And so Romans is it's a huge book. We could spend months and months studying it. I encourage you to spend months and months studying it, but um, that's probably the extent that I'm going to go into most of these as we go through them, unless somebody's got a comment, question. Did you say it was like divided up in five different segments? Uh, I didn't. I wouldn't deny that as a possibility, um, but I didn't, I didn't say that now. No, now you did. I'm I'm thinking it through. Like, okay, I I could possibly understand some. The history section is five books. Yes. Oh. Each each of these um, books can be divided into different ways, um, and I wouldn't deny that. Romans was probably five sections. That would make sense. Makes it seven. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, so a lot of those, uh, you can find different outlines that break it down into things like that. I'm not sure on Romans. Not off the top of my head. All right. <clears throat> um, First and Second Corinthians then follows from that. So First Corinthians is thought to be written from Ephesus, um, and the basis for that comes from First Corinthians chapter sixteen, verse eight. Um, Paul says, "But I shall remain in Ephesus until Pentecost." So it seems like that's where he's writing from, or that that's where he's on his way to. <clears throat> um, there were several letters written to the, the church at Corinth, um, and this is one of them. Uh, and it was written in response to some pretty major issues that were going on in the church. 
And so Paul addresses those, and he's very blunt about some of them, letting them know that you are doing things terribly. Uh, 2 Corinthians then follows that up with joy at their repentance and, and the fact that they listened to his first letter. Now, there are in, in 2 Corinthians, there are a couple of verses that seem to indicate that there were other letters written which uh, raises some discussion and argument about, well, why don't we have those? And you tell me, why don't we have those? They weren't inspired. God didn't want us to. It's that simple. It's not a major thing. Um, It is very likely that Paul wrote lots and lots of letters and that only the ones that God wanted preserved and that God inspired in the first place are the ones that we have. Um, so it's, it's not an issue that there are, quote-unquote, lost letters of Paul. Um, most likely he was a prolific li- writer with lots and lots of letters that were sent out. Um, sometimes these are called epistles. Same idea. It means a letter. Um, don't, you don't have to overemphasize that idea. But unlike in the Old Testament... When we saw First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Samuel, those were actually a single straight-through book that were divided for sh- sake of the scrolls. When we get to First and Seconds in the New Testament, they are actually separate. One was written, um, and then Paul got word from somebody, or received a letter, or something happened, and then he writes another letter. And like I said, to Corinth, he probably wrote several letters um, over a period of time. So the first one was probably written from Ephesus. The second one was probably written while he was on his second missionary journey somewhere in Macedonia. Any comments on First and Second Corinthians? The, the Pentecostals make a big deal out of some of the things in First Corinthians totally ignoring the fact that it's a letter of rebuke. And the very thing he's rebuking, they're very good at doing it. <laughs> yes. There, there's some um, interesting things in there to, to dig into and consider. Um, and an awareness that because Paul is, is rebuking them, is getting after them, that means that some of the things that they were doing, we probably don't want to be doing um, and, and definitely not the way that they were doing it. Um, but it, that, that's one of the amazing things to me. I'm, I'm going on a sidetrack. It's okay. <coughs> i got to find this specific. Can you explain more about Pentecostal? Pentecostals, they believe that the Pentecostals believe, generally, I'm simplifying here, they, they believe in speaking in tongues and oh. gifts of the Holy Spirit that are very, very important. To, uh, to some, it's so extreme that if you don't speak in tongues, you can't be a believer. Yeah. Like um, a lot of sign gifts is what they're referred to, or miraculous gifts. Um, you look at, at like the the sudden laying on of hands and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, that kind of a thing. Okay. <sighs> yeah, we're going to. Oh, go ahead. Yes. The the city of Corinth was a terrible place. Think San Francisco or Las Vegas type of thing. Uh, yeah, <coughs> New Orleans. Yeah, um, and so it it got to the point that to Corintha Corinthianize is to become like that. So yeah. Yep. All right. I want to keep going. But I think it's, it's better. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4. I'm going to geek out for a minute. So we know that 1 Corinthians is written as a rebuke. That there's a lot of issues and problems. And Paul is, he's not going to pull any punches. 
He's going to tell them flat out, you're wrong. And these are major things that you have got to fix. Um, at one point, he's even going to the, get to the point where there is a someone who is living in sexual sin that he says, you are worse than the unbelievers. You're worse than the Gentiles. They don't even brag about this stuff, and you're bragging about it. And so he, he gets very, very um, harsh with them. But chapter 1, starting off in verse 4, I thank my God always concerning you. For the grace of God, which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you were not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We know that he's about to lay the hammer down and let them know. And yet, how does he start off? I thank my God for you. I am, I am excited for this opportunity because I know that in everything, he has blessed you richly. He's going to tell them, hey, these gifts, you're misusing them. You're not doing it right. And yet he emphasizes the fact that they have uh, in everything, they were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, um, not lacking in any gift. And so he's very excited for them. He also doesn't say, well, you're, you're terrible, horrible heathens that God hates and, and you shouldn't call yourself Christians. In fact, he goes on to say that, that um, you are not lacking any gift. You're awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will confirm you to the end blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're not blameless in and of themselves. And yet he recognizes the grace and mercy of Christ has been poured out on them. Yeah, they're not doing things right. Yeah, they're, they're in error. And yet, Paul has this, this focus and emphasis on the fact that Christ has saved them. Christ has made them blameless. Now, you guys need to clean up your act. You need to get these things straightened out because you're not doing it right. But I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. Yes. Yes. Yeah. They do it because they love them. Out of love. I think that is what Paul yep. so If you want to do an an interesting study, read the the prayers of Paul. It's kind of at the start of these of most of his his epistles, he'll say something to the effect of I pray for you, I thank God for you. It it's a prayer of some kind. And, and they are fascinating um, to understand his heart and his attitude. And then when you recognize what he's going to be doing in that book, like this one, he's going to be rebuking them, but he starts off loving them and letting them know, hey, I, I love you and I'm excited for you. You need to get this right. Um, in others, you know, he's, he is in suffering and pain and having problems and he's so thankful for these people because they've encouraged him and they've helped him. Or, you know, wh whatever the case might be, there are, there are different prayers that Paul utters that are just, it, it's an amazing study. I, I would encourage that if you're, if you're looking for something to, to study and dig into, not necessarily reading everything straight through, but going through and seeing those, it's, it's pretty cool. Was there another comment, question? All right, we are getting up on time, so um, I'm going to call it at First and Second Corinthians, and we will pick up with Galatians next time. Thank you for being here and your kind attention. We didn't we didn't make it not far, did we? <laughs>
we were moving moving right along. So I, I made it all the way through the first page. All right. <laughs> all right. Let's uh, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for so many things that we can learn from it. Um, and as we as we catch this overview and just get a general idea, Lord, may it may it spark a desire to dig in deeper, to learn more, um, to see more of your glory and your beauty and your grace. Lord, thank you that you have given us your word. Thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in it. Help us to love you more and more as each day goes by. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.